Welcome back. God, I haven't done this in a while. Um, yes, so today I've decided we're going to talk about Roberto Calasa, who has been called a literary institution of one. And I've also decided to stop speaking as though I've got a gun trained on me at any moment, because I can tell for some of the people listening that probably got pretty old. So, uh, yes, Calasso runs an Italian publishing house, Avelfi, since the 90s, I think. He's published a, a fair few books talking about just about everything. Greek myths, Kafka, Talleyrand, the Vienna Gas Company, the history of publishing. There's just, there's all sorts of stuff in here. And last year, I sat down and decided to read all of it, everything that was translated into English. So, I suppose we'll talk a bit about him first, in the same way that we did Kazantzakis. Uh, Calasso is a lot like the written, the the literate equivalent, or the literature equivalent of Eric Satie, in that he's looking at the same theme from different angles, like somebody walking around a 3D sculpture. Uh, to explain, Satie's piano suites are made of several, not all of them, but most of them, famously the gymnopedies, are made of three or more separate pieces that have the same kind of set of intervals or the same theme, and each different part of the suite looks at the same set of intervals or the same central musical idea from a different angle and gives it a different tone. Hidden parts are able to come out and they give the whole thing a new form as you sort of walk around it and inspect it from each of the three different individual pieces. You might recall the story of the ten blind men and the elephant. And uh, Roberto Calasso frequently touches on the same underlying themes and he gives them more depth by dressing them up in different clothes. And the result is the understanding that what, what it is that he's talking about, mythology and history, hunting, sacrifice, snakes, the death of the sacrificial mindset that we used to have and the birth of the modern world, are universal ideas. And they're present even in places where they might be unrecognizable. I feel like, and I'm nowhere near certain of this, a lot of good authors do this. They just, they pick one set of ideas to focus on for their entire lives and they just fine tune the spectrum of experience down to its most essential parts. And then they explain it from as many different angles as they can. It reminds me as well of uh, Stephen King, who does things in kind of the reverse way. He writes constantly about tiny country towns, you know, usually in the vicinity of Maine, because that's where he's from and because he's presumably lazy like that. But he uses the same characters and he uses the same kind of subplots and the same locations, he does the same thing where he looks at them differently, but he's looking at images, not themes. So the same images are rearranged and twisted into different contexts to tell a different story. He's drawing out the depth in the images instead. He's drawing out, and it's not as brainlit tear as I make it sound, because he's looking at the capacity for similar elements to represent different parts of the human experience. So there's still merit in that, it's just different. Maybe you could call that one of the differences between literature and non-literature. Focus on an image rather than a theme, or maybe there's no difference and I'm just being rude, I don't know. Anyway, in the context of Calasso, his exploration of all of these central themes at the same time means that he frequently draws examples in one book from all of the other books without properly explaining them. You have to read more than one at least to really understand what he's trying to say. Nobody's quite as good at making obscure references at this as this man, but a lot of them are just references to stuff that he's already said, or that he's going to say. Maybe that's not a good thing, but I still think he's one of the best authors out there. And honestly, these books, they're not intended for people who don't already have an understanding of the subject matter. You can't really jump right into this without having done a bit of background reading first, even if that just means Wikipedia, unless you want to be very bored and confused. The trouble with Wikipedia, though, is that Calasso typically writes about whatever the topic is in such a way that 
even knowing what it is and what it's about, you'll still be surprised until you get used to him. I mean, we can put some of that down to artistic flair and down to the style, but at the moment I'm inclined to attribute to him this unique genius as well. Because he surprises you until you understand generally where he's going, and then he can't really surprise you at all after that. Anyway, onto the books. Every one of the books is a book-length essay, or it's a series of essays, some based in fact more than others. Frequently they stray from straight-up fiction or fact and become philosophical rambles, and with a few exceptions they're structured with uh, individual free-floating paragraphs, which were written and can be read in any order you want. So you could pick up any of these books, pick, flip to a random page, and you would have just as much understanding of what he was talking about as, you know, any other page, basically. You have to read all of it. You have to read a, a wide range of it to understand what he's talking about at any given moment. So I thought I would do the same thing I did for Cousin Zakis and just go through all the books with a suggested order of reading. We're going to begin with one of my favorite texts, The Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony. It's by far the most famous. It's also the most accessible, at least to people like, I'm, I'm going to say us, because I kind of understand the kind of person who would watch this video. Because it's talking about Greek mythology, obviously, and that's something that if you live in the West, you probably have at least a little understanding of. But it's not the Greek mythology retelling that you would expect from someone like Stephen Fry, where he just sort of dryly goes through them one after the other. and you know, he looks at them from the outside, and here's a, you know, this isn't directly related, but I'm not such a big fan of Stephen Fry. I think he's just a smug intellectual. He's he's just not he's not worth paying attention to really. If you want an introduction to Greek mythology, I'd recommend a series by the Stephanidis brothers, which, as far as I've seen, you either have to order online or go to Greece to get, which can be very annoying, but they're very good. Anyway, um, Calasso's account is more interesting than that, because it's nonlinear, and because he tells this, the history of ancient Greece at the same time, he talks about the ideas of the Byzantine philosophers about the pagan religions at the same time, he mixes postmodern philosophy in there, and he talks about the mysteries a lot, which is by far the most interesting part, and what got me into the study of the Orphic cult because nobody writes about Orphic myths unless, you know, except in commentaries on the Derveni Papyrus. It's difficult to even realize that that kind of stuff exists if you're not a scholar, because they never talk about it in any of the pop books, you know? So bringing that into a text like this is quite a great thing for that alone, but it's interesting because Calasso is writing about the contradictions in pagan Greek mythology, since it's so decentralized, obviously. You know, there's no one account of everything, which is yet another thing that no other myth book seems to have done. Uh, there is a bit of that in Stephanidis, just a bit at the end in the footnotes. Generally, they tend to tell it like a straight up story, which is why it's good for an introduction, because uh, that's the thing with tellings of Greek myths. On the one hand, you want people to be able to understand what's going on. You don't want them to be you don't want them to be confused by endless variations from minor, you know, city-states that no one cared about, that added, like, one thing to the myth, like, oh, Heracles had a kid here as well, and they just never talk about it at Athens. You know, you don't want that to clog up the whole book, but at the same time, you want to get a, a sense of how mutable these stories were, and how long they survived. Hundreds of years, obviously, there's going to be tons of variations. And the best thing... Actually, not the best thing. I already talked about the best thing, but an extremely good thing about Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony is that Calasso tries to set out the entirety of the Greek mythological canon into a, a rough chronological order, which I'm sure most of us would consider that nigh impossible. So that's worth picking up, even if you don't intend to go any further with the man. Second, I would recommend Ruin of Cash, most copies of this book that you get will tell you two things, one of which is a quote from Italo Calvino on the cover. It deals with two topics. The first is Talleyrand, 
The second is everything else. <laughs> and you don't really understand what that means until you've picked it up, because he really does talk about every single topic of human existence. It's the first work that gives you an idea of the scope of Calasso's kind of obscure thesis, which is all of these sort of ruminations on the death of the idea of sacrifice, the birth of modernity. In, this, in The Ruin of Cash, he's looking at it through the prism of the French Revolution and the myth of some old African kingdom, but it takes about 80 pages to get to that point. Everything before that point is the setup. You'll get used to long setup with these books. And uh, Cadmus and Cash, which by the way is K-A-S-C-H, basically will prepare you for the rest of the work. If you don't like him at all, well, if you didn't like him at all, you wouldn't have fin finished Cadmus, but if you find that you can't stand him after this point, or if you think you've read enough, you can stop there and you'll have a good idea. But if you want to keep going, then you're in for some interesting times. All of the books deal with either the extremely old or the birth of the modern, in the same hyper-referential style that you'll be used to if you've read those two books. And from here, it does get a little more, a little more specialist, and it does get a little more interesting. But the order stops mattering, really. So I'm just going to talk about them in whatever. I guess they, they come in clumps, I suppose. They all essentially deal with the same topic anyway, but I can suggest a few different ways to start. If you know anything about Hinduism and the Vedas, go to Ardor, then Ka. The former explores Vedic culture, which, you know, ancient Aryans who practiced the religion which was the precursor to Hinduism. And Ka is an exploration of Vedic religion which turned then into Hinduism. And it also talks about the beginnings of Buddhism, Buddhism as well. It studies their shared philosophical and metaphysical characteristics, and it tries to put them into the context of Indian and Indo-European history as well. So you get an idea of kind of at what point and why one of those religions transitioned into the, into the next. Uh, from there, I think literature and the gods. Literature and the gods would be a good next choice. There are lots of segments in the previous two books about the gods wrapping themselves up in verse, quote-unquote, and immortalizing themselves through verse. And those kind of snippets are, more, are commented on more fully in this book. The book deals with the role of structure and of metered poetry in communicating with the divine. So it's quite interesting. You might, it's quite short as well because it, I mean, the whole thing is just based off a few paragraphs of the previous two although it probably wasn't written. I can't remember which the order in which they were written, but I suppose it doesn't really matter, does it? But you could read them in any order, of course. Remember, it's just a recommendation. Uh, next, Tiepolo Pink and Baudelaire's Folly. Birth of the Modern. We've moved on from the ancient now. Uh, birth of the Modern through the prism of Tiepolo's paintings and the environment, or the literary environment, of late 19th century Paris. Tiepolo is more mystical, and it's more spiritually focused than the latter book. There's a chapter at the end that actually starts explaining the Orphic uh, components of Cadmus in a bit more detail, which is interesting, and connecting it to this slightly obscure Renaissance painter. And uh, Baudelaire's folly is a lot less focused, because it's not as much about Baudelaire as it is about an anthropological study of Paris 200 years ago. It's more... F it's about a host of authors and artists and crazy people, <laughs> basically, that kind of illustrate the birth of a whole new mindset. So both of the books are quite... Both of the books are a sacred and a secular take on the same, mo on the same movement, on the same moment. It doesn't really matter when the rest are read, either. Uh, there's one called K, just the letter K, that talks about Kafka's work. I read that one ages ago, so I can't really talk about it too much. Uh, the 49 Steps. Actually, this one has structure, because it's several essays on authors from the Enlightenment onwards. They're quite obscure, and they're a bit forbidding, until you kind of read a bit more of his work and go back. And you might want to read the thing that the essay is about before you read the essay because you won't learn anything about it if you come from it the other way. Uh, what next? 
The Art of the Publisher. Oh, I like this one. I really do. Uh, retrospective on Colasso's time working at Adelphi Publishing and on the meaning of physical books in and of themselves. If you've read This Is Not the End of the Book, which was that conversation between Umberto Eco and the filmmaker, yeah, or if you've read Anti-Fragile by Taleb, you might kind of know what you're in for with this, but I do like all of those things. And what comes next? The Unnameable Present. Oh, that's his latest one. Uh, it's actually a continuation insofar as there could be a sequel in this guy's bibliography. I guess it's a sequel to The Ruin of Cash. It's much shorter. It talks a lot about the 21st century in the first half and, you know, how aimless and... I mean, it's called The Unnameable Present. You know what it's about. It's about postmodernism destroying the basis for everything that we used to assign value. And the second half is like a German version of John Reed's Ten Days That Shook the World, if you've read that. Uh, Ten Days That Shook the World was a journalist. Was he American or British? I don't remember. He was Anglo, anyway. His name's John Reed. Of course he's Anglo. Uh, in Russia, in 1917, just picking up snippets of conversation from public places and trying to get a feel for what people thought and felt in during the Russian Revolution. And the unnameable present second half is kind of like that, except for Weimar Germany. So it's a, a sort of snapshot comprised of all of these unrelated anecdotes and these moments in time that when you put them all together and consider them in that context, they kind of deal with the decadence of modernity. And um, I, real, I was going to make this video last year, but I sort of, you know, I had my notes and I left them lying about and got very busy. But I had decided it was time to finally talk about this guy because in about a month's time, his next book will be translated and published. The Celestial Hunter. And um, it was, I, I looked that up because I knew that was coming at some time this year. I didn't realize it was going to be so soon. And that basically convinced me that I had to get back into this whole video thing again. Because I'll be looking out for The Celestial Hunter. And I suggest that you keep an eye out for it as well, because I'm sure it'll be very interesting. 